I was born and grew up in Rome, Italy, so I caught the football virus early on in life. Through life's many twists and turns, I ended up in the United States and also became deeply engaged with South African matters towards the end of a slow death of apartheid. I managed to combine my personal passion for the game, I still play today, with my professional training as a historian to become a properly credentialed footballogist of sorts. And over the past two decades, I've written several books, published journal articles, I've taught online courses with hundred or more students, as well as small brick and mortar seminars for history majors. I've been interviewed by media from around the world, given plenty of public talks, and I've coached also youth in the United States and also in South Africa. So footballogy, if you will, is not just a distraction, it's not just a secondary thing, it's not a trend. Footballogy is really what I do. And in the course of these 20 years or so that I've been working on football, I've also learned a few things about writing in English about the game and how academics and journalists write differently, but also share some things in common. And I want to share some of these thoughts with you. So what is it that's most valuable about how academic footballogists write about the game? That's one of my main things I want to reflect on. And I want to focus also specifically on the scholars who write about the game outside of North America and Western Europe. I think if you look at research expertise, this is a distinguishing feature of what academics do, particularly in terms of time spent in the field. What I'm talking about here is time spent in the archives, in the country that one is studying, getting to know people, speaking the language properly, getting to break bread with your uh, interviewees, for instance, uh, players, journalists, and so on. This is the kind of investment that I think academics tend to make in their work that journalists find more challenging because of a number of reasons. The other factor that could be highlighted here and should be is methodology. What historians do in particular, and I think ethnographers and others also do this well, you know, the methodology entails digging almost endlessly in institutional archives, personal archives, looking at photographs, looking at video sources, reading memoirs, as well as the secondary literature, and of course spending lots and lots of time uh, interviewing people who made the history that you're trying to write about. The ability to integrate all these sources together and to tease out fact from fiction uh, is something that I think is also distinctive about how academics work. There's something uniquely valuable what scholars bring in terms of their topics, their ability to contextualize information, and their working mode. Historians, for instance, are usually very good at contextualizing particular events people and places within larger social change. In terms of the topics that scholars tend to focus on, you know, we, we go beyond mixed zone cliches between, you know, beyond what the usual transfer banter might be or the latest controversy regarding a refereeing decision or a manager's diatribe. You know, we tend to locate our work on sport within or in connection to uh, topics such as race, ethnicity, nationalism, capitalism, culture, gender, sexuality, and so on. Historians and ethnographers are also quite comfortable with ambiguities and contradictions. Furthermore, scholars, because we work in the academy, a kind of interesting non-commercial space, we are reasonably free to pursue projects over the longer term rather than the short term. And we're not as tethered to market pressures, whether that is the pressure of the deadline, the pressure of getting a larger audience or Twitter followers. And finally, citing our sources is central to our mission. Now I say this because it has happened quite often in my career, and I know in the career of other academics, that we suddenly see our work cited without attribution in a variety of settings. For example, just recently, while I was eagerly 
going through a soccer magazine called The Blizzard, I discovered a piece of an article I wrote over 12, 15 years ago, almost exactly copied word for word on the page. I was struck by this because there was no mention uh, of my work in the article. There was no bibliography or anything like that. So I contacted the editor of the magazine, and the uh, editor of the magazine basically passed the buck, tried to get me to engage in a conversation with the author of the article. Unfortunately, this is not a, a, a singular example. A South African journalist also published a book, The Year of the World Cup, which uh, borrowed heavily and at times even plagiarized my ideas, sources, and analysis from a book I published in 2004 titled La Duma, Soccer Politics and Society in South Africa. And I almost threw up my breakfast one morning when I saw this very author talking about the South African Soccer League, which is a league that no one really had looked at in any detail before I did from a scholarly perspective and was literally using my words on national television. So there's still too many journalists who are unsympathetic to the academic way uh, or simply have uh, very loose professional ethics. What can academic footballologists learn from good journalists? Well, first of all, the ability to write well. I think here of Simon Cooper, of course, footballing against the enemy comes to mind, but also David Winner with Brilliant Orange. Uh, Sid Lowe's recent book, Fear and Loathing in La Liga, a history of the Barça Real Madrid rivalry. Um, Eduardo Galeano, the majestic Uruguayan author of Sun, uh, Soccer in Sun and Shadow. Also, journalists usually have, or good journalists ha usually have a very good nose for a story. You know, Grant Wall's The Beckham Experiment uh, comes immediately to mind. Um, or James Montague's book on football in the Middle East as well. Journalists are also exceptionally good with social media and at times with blogging. You know, academics sometimes tend to be perceived and, and, and sometimes even are kind of distant from the street up there perched in their ivory tower. But journalists' way of engaging with social media directly with their readers is something that academics should definitely take note of. Finally, I would add a couple of more points. Journalists are excellent at working under the pressure of meeting a deadline. Journalists do exceptionally well at taking events on the pitch seriously. And I still find today that academic footballogists sometimes treat soccer as if we're a, a secondary concern in a research project that's really trying to make some larger points. Ultimately, what I'd like to see is a more productive tension between academics and journalists writing about football in the English language. The Football Scholars Forum, which is hosting this roundtable, is an online book club that Alex Galarza and I founded at Michigan State University several years ago. It's an international community of scholars, journalists, bloggers, and informed fans who are united by their love for the game. The Football Scholars Forum has created and sustained over the years an informal digital commons right, where we can share the very individual act of reading with each other. And in doing so, I think we flesh out the book's meaning and also give it some greater emotional power. What we need is more sharing and more dialogue between scholars and journalists. As the great Barcelona midfielder Xavi puts it, I'm a romantic. Some teams don't or can't pass the ball. What are you playing for? What's the point? That's not football. Combine, pass, play. That's football, for me at least, says Xavi. Wanna play?